Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago, and the welcome to the Ministry of Health's update on the national COVID-19 response for the 25th of August, 2021. We are pleased to be here with you once again to provide accurate and up-to-date information on the COVID-19 virus and the vaccines, which are readily available to you. On our panel today, we have Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health. We welcome back Dr. Hazel Othello, Director, Mental Health Unit, Ministry of Health, and Dr. Jose Nunez. Dr. Nunez is the Head of Department, Pediatrics, at the San Fernando General Hospital. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and I will be the moderator for today. Dr. Parasram will begin by presenting the latest clinical, vaccination, and epidemiological updates. Hi, good morning, Tangsal. Good morning to Dr. Otello, um, Dr. Nunez, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. So, if I could have the first slide with the COVID-19 update for 24th of August, 2021. The total number of persons tested at both public and private facilities now stand at 303,118. Over the last 24 hours, we would have reported 199 new cases from both islands. The total positive cases now stand since 12th of March 2020, 43,344. Total recovered patients thus far, 37,003. In hospital, there are 311 persons and in the step-down facilities, 88, with 1,244 deaths to date. The total patients in state quarantine facilities, 145. Those in home isolation at this time, 4,499. By way of our vaccination program, and again to thank everyone that has participated and gone ahead and had, had your vaccines, we are at 490,958 persons with one dose. Total persons fully vaccinated with two doses, 372,614. Just a little breakdown further before we go into the, the community cases. Um, the number of patients at various facilities in the step down and hospital. At the Coover Hospital and Multi Training Facility, there are 72 persons, 32, 13 of those in ICU, 18 of those in HDU. At the Cora Hospital, 20, Augustus Long, 46. No one at this time in the St. Anne's Hospital with COVID positive. Arima Hospital, 48. New Point Fortin Hospital, 41. St. James Complex, 42. Scarborough Regional Hospital at the 438 and the Scarborough Regional Hospital at Signal Hill 4. If I could have my first slide of the community cases, please. So I'm going to go into a breakdown of the active cases in the community. And the first slide basically shows the distribution throughout the country in terms of percentages. If we're starting with Tobago on the left hand top, 10.4% of the cases in Tobago at this time. A few months ago, we would have seen Tobago hovering between 2 and 4 percent, similar to Nariva Mayaro. And we have seen over the last month or so an upsurge in cases in Tobago. Victoria, 28.7 percent of the cases. St. Patrick, 9.9 percent. Nariva Mayaro traditionally has been throughout the epidemic the lowest, the county with the lowest percentage of cases because of the density of the population as well as other, other epidemiological factors. Stays at 1.3 percent. St. George West, 5.1%, St. George Central, 10.5%, St. George East is at 10%, another area in the country where we have a high density of the population, but it seems to be holding more or less, St. Andrew, St. David, 6.1%, and County Kearney, 181 So the counties to keep an eye on again, Tobago, Victoria, County Kearney, St. George East seems to be um, settling a little bit from the last time we spoke. Next slide. So this gives an idea of the home isolation patients by clinical um, disposition. Recoveries are at 6.8% of the total. Transferred to facility 5.3%. Symptomatic persons 38.5%. And we are seeing a slight difference where a large proportion of the persons are now asymptomatic 49.5%. Next slide. Comorbidities, again diabetes and hypertension are the leading comorbidities with those affected with COVID. 28.2% for diabetes, hypertension has gone up a little bit, 36.5% in this particular group. Heart disease, 37 pulmonary issues, 0.3%, immunodeficiency, 04 
those who are pregnant again pregnancy is not uh it's not a comorbidity but it, it it is a state where you can have increased complications if you do get infected in pregnancy asthma 14.9 percent and other standard 13.5 next slide this is just an overall cases with comorbidities versus without more or less 50 50 50.2 without com with comorbidities and 49.8 with comorbidities next slide so this other slide gives you a age breakdown again we see that between the 0 and 19 the number of persons infected are at home at a low level 5.39 percent of the total affected people and we want to keep it that way um, and all our measures have been geared towards protecting the children using our public health measures dr nunez will go into some detail as to um, using the, the vaccine safely in children and we have that new additional armory for the children 12 to 18 which will help us and go a long way towards protecting those vulnerable children we have in the 20 to 39 age group 25.62 percent 40 to 59 31.32 percent 60 to 79 20.98 and a fairly increasing percentage in the 80 plus which is concerning and we'll ask those special groups to please get vaccinated as early as you can because we know that the morbidity increases as you increase in age in the 80 plus the morbidity and mortality mortality goes up to almost 20 percent in that particular age group next slide so the last slide will give you a age sex distribution for those patients at home and more or less 52.3 percent female versus 47.7 percent male Al, that's my last slide and the end of the clinical update for this morning. Thank you very much, CMO. For some persons, getting a vaccine is no big deal. But for others, the thought of being injected can bring an on anxiety and even fear. Dr. Hazel Othello is here to help us to find some coping me mechanisms to deal with this anxiety. Dr. Othello, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Alexander, Dr. Paris Ram, Dr. Nunez, listeners, viewers, Trinidad and Tobago and beyond. The press, good morning to you as well. Today I want to talk about supporting persons and in, particularly in particular children and adolescents through the process of vaccination. As we are aware, all children between the ages of 12 and 18 are now being encouraged to get vaccinated and many of them have already had their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So we want them to get vaccinated but we want them to do it without being, without feeling in any way traumatized or without being unduly anxious. We are aware that for some persons, as Al said a short while ago, the, the mere act of getting vaccinated or being stuck with a needle for any reason, having a medical procedure done can be quite anxiety provoking and it's been observed that this is particularly prevalent among adolescents they can be quite anxious and that anxiety can sometimes produce an actual physical reaction this reaction produces actual physical symptoms that differ from person to person however this can be prevented and where needed where the anxiety is already happening, it can be alleviated. We need to do this in order to make the act of vaccination easier for these young people because we want to protect them. We also need you to know that medical staff are trained to recognize these symptoms when people experience them and to distinguish the difference between symptoms brought on by anxiety and the actual adverse effects of a vaccine or um, actual side effects of the vaccine. And when these anxiety related symptoms do occur, medical practitioners are trained to treat with them, to manage them. So it's even that the possibility of having an anxiety reaction should not be a reason not to get vaccinated. There's actually a name that has been coined for this combination of symptoms that are sometimes experienced in this situation. And it's now called immunization stress-related response. And I need you to know that that term was not coined in, res in response to COVID and vaccination. It was around well before that. And there's actual World Health Organization guidance on it 
describing it and advising on how to treat with it. So the potential causes of immunization stress-related response, or to, show, to abbreviate it, ISRR, involve biological, psychological, and social factors. And I'll now ask for the first slide to be brought up. So we have biological factors, as you can see on the slide, things like age, younger people, teenagers are more predisposed towards this. Genetic factors can contribute. Low body size can, or low body mass can contribute. The female gender is more um, at risk than males for this type of reaction. Then we have psychological factors, such as previous negative experiences with vaccines or with medical procedures, anxiety about vaccinations or medical procedures, previous history of having had an acute stress reaction to any stimulus. And then we have social factors. These include negative information having been received from family, from friends, from media, or from other sources. Other social factors involve witnessing negative reaction from others so that if teenagers see another teenager having this kind of reaction, they are more prone to react in a similar way. And then we have cultural beliefs that con can contribute towards this type of reaction. Uh, vaccinating teenagers is not something new and that is how we know that this type of reaction can occur and is more likely to occur among teenagers than in other age groups. Our teenagers are frequently vaccinated at things against things like the HPV, human papillomavirus vaccine. They get vaccinated against certain types of meningitis and they get their booster shots for rubella. And so at times when these vaccinations are being done, these types of reactions have been observed. But as I said before, I want to remind you that doctors are trained to recognize them and trained to treat with them. We don't want to just have to treat these reactions when they happen. We want to prevent them. And in that regard, that's why I described the biological, psychological, and social factors that contribute to them. So now that we know what can contribute to them, we're in a better position to talk about how to treat them. And the most important thing is to prepare these adolescents for the process of vaccination before the day of their vaccine so that they know what to expect and so that any anxiety they may be feeling about it from things they may have heard others say can be alleviated. We want to recognize young people who we think might be particularly vulnerable. So if you have a child who is predisposed towards being unduly anxious, or who has had a bad reaction to a medical procedure in the past and may be worried about it, you need to spend some time reassuring that child so that that child's vaccination experience will be a pleasant one. Here are some preventive strategies that we can use to help these young people. And for this presentation, I didn't just, you know, use my own resources. I actually collaborated with some parents, some local parents who have had their, their young people, their teenagers vaccinated. And I had one of my, I was really busy, but I had somebody help me with this. And she asked them, what worked for you? What worked for your teen? And we collated some of the responses and I will provide them for you at this point. So this is what is known to work. This has worked already in our own local context. Number one, parents do your own research, but I have to specify what I mean by research. Have your question that questions answered, but get your answers from reliable sources. In other words, understand all that you can about the vaccine so that you can answer your children's questions about the vaccine, but get your information from reliable sources. And we've told you many times on this program what the reliable sources are the Ministry of Health website, the World Health Organization website, the Pan American Health Organization website, and other accredited university websites. 
encourage your children to do their own research because we're talking about teenagers and they're doing research for school projects and things like that so encourage them to do some research of their own if they have questions but again we need you to assist them in identifying the reliable sources so they don't get incorrect information also encourage them to ask their questions have honest age appropriate conversations with your children about vaccination talk to your teens about what they're seeing on social media and answer their questions about what they're seeing because they may see things that you may be shocked to find out about you know so have those conversations with them don't shy away from the conversations but provide honest answers share your thoughts and feelings when appropriate with your children but remember the term when appropriate because children feed off the anxieties of adults. So if you are anxious, that's not the best time to, you know, share certain things. You may want to take some time, settle, and then share your thoughts and feelings in a calm way with your young people. On the day of the vaccine, be honest with the doctors and nurses about any health concerns you may have any challenges or allergies that your child may be having you know you have a form to fill out but if there's anything else that you think may be a source of concern that's not mentioned on the form feel free to ask a question also be encouraging and supportive to your children do not force a frightened or worried child or teenager to take the vaccine while they are frightened or worried take the time to reassure that per young person to answer their questions if they still have questions to address their fears and then when they're in a calm state of mind then you proceed to have them vaccinated another helpful tip for particularly anxious children is distraction in other words you could have them listen to their favorite music on their earphones while they're being vaccinated and what we've seen in many cases like this when children have and young people have to have medical procedures and they're distracted with things like that sometimes they don't even know when the needle went in and out and they had their vaccine so they don't experience any significant pain and even if they do it's not particularly worrisome for them do not scold chastise or embarrass a child or a teenager if you think that they were not brave on the day that they were vaccinated reassure them let them know that it's okay to feel that way but that you're proud of them for having been vaccinated and now that they've been vaccinated they're safer with regard to the covid virus spend time talking with them while they're in the observation area and asking them questions so that you know how they're feeling and if they're having any difficulties report those concerns to the medical staff who are present and if after you leave the vaccination site anything arises that you think may be a health concern please remember to take your child to the nearest health center to his or her pediatrician or to your general family doctor in summary and if we would pull up the third um, slide for that summary proactive honest communication is important management of social media exposure and supportive attitudes towards children is very important and these are important strategies for preventing immunization stress related response and for effectively supporting adolescents through the vaccination process thank you and thank you very much dr othello i i must let you know that i took my 12 year old last week to get his his um his vaccine and he was very proud very confident and just going through your slides i realized that i ticked some <laughs> of the boxes and i guess that's a, that accounts for how well he um how well he took the vaccine and he's doing quite well so far so as we move on last week wednesday the ministry of health began vaccinating children between the ages of 12 to 18 with the pfizer vaccine at several locations across Trinidad and Tobago. The ministry, the WHO, CDC, and the FDA, FDA have said multiple times that the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine is safe and effective. 
but what are the benefits of vaccinating children? Dr. Nunez is here to answer this question and more. Welcome, Dr. Nunez. Thank you very much, Mr. Al Alexander. Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parzram, Dr. Hazel Otello, Director of Mental Health at the Ministry of Health, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public, good morning. First of all, I wanted to thank the Ministry of Health for this invitation, for this opportunity to address the parents and the children uh, on the benefits of vaccinating children against COVID-19. As a pediatrician, vaccinations, we, we say, is our bread and butter. We live and breathe vaccines. We start giving vaccines to children from the age of two months. So it's something that we are very well aware of the benefits of vaccination. Um, a little bit on the side, I'd ha I had not seen a child with whooping cough in Trinidad until I went to do postgraduate in the 1990s. And that was because people in those days in Trinidad, less media, less social media, less fake news, and they would just basically get the, uh, take the advice from the doctor, doctor knows best, and get their vaccination. Of course, now we are in different times, and that, that's where the challenges come in with vaccination. But vaccination is nothing new. First slide, please. Next. So the obvious, benef obvious benefit of having your child vaccinated is so that your child doesn't get COVID. That is what everybody wants. But the argument people would say is that children are less likely to get serious illness. This is true. Less hospitalizations and less death. Uh, but children can get COVID and they still, they, they can get it very, very seriously. There is a condition called MIS-C, which stands for multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. And I'll be speaking a little bit later on, uh, a little bit more on that uh, as we go along. The other th thing to factor in is this Delta variant, which is having a very harmful effect on children in the USA. Just l last week, the headlines were out, for example, saying, news headlines saying, pediatric hospitals in the US in peril as Delta hits children. We fortunately are not here in that situation as yet, but we are hoping not to be in that situation. We are hoping that is the message we want to get across for children to get their vaccines, for adults, parents to get their vaccines, so we do not reach that situation. Because believe me, when you hear the children's hospitals in Dallas, the children's hospitals in Mississippi, Mississippi USA being full with children, uh, having to open up more space, that is obviously a very serious problem, and we hope we never reach to that stage. Next slide. So, preventing transmission. The children are very, very good, as they say, if they, if in, in terms of sharing things, they will be sharing the germs. And so, it is very common for children to be transmitters, for them to be passing on these infections. But we also want the children to be if they're vaccinated, so you don't have you have less reduction, um, spreading it to all the adults, their grandparents and the teachers as well. And we all keep hearing. We I'm sure we've heard this term, herd immunity, and part of that herd immunity, we obviously have to include children. They are part of the the herd after all. And if we want to achieve this herd immunity, we have to vaccinate the children as well. We cannot forget them. They will be a big factor in after we moving along with the olders, um, adults and the, their parents and the teachers. Vaccinating the children will be a part of the herd immunity approach. Next slide. Schools. Kids need to go back to school. We keep hearing this and uh, it's 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 it plays a big mental health uh, effect on the children and also on the parents as well, on their well-being. Uh, it's affecting obviously their education and the interaction that children do in schools, their social development. Children need to go back to school and more importantly, they need to stay in school because we hear reports in other countries where they open the schools and as soon as there is an outbreak, one child getting um, COVID-19 in, in the class, panic breaks out and then the school gets shut down and of course the way to avoid that is vaccines 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 um, as an analogy um, 
most of the times when I see children in my office coming for chicken pox vaccine is because they have an outbreak in the school. And, and that situation creates panic. They come in for their vaccines. But remember that vaccination is prevention and you need weeks before you get your full immune response. So it doesn't make sense to be giving them a, a, a vaccine when it, there's already an outbreak. And so we should be looking at that. There'll be much more, people will be much more at ease if the teachers as well as the students have had their vaccines. So when there is a case of COVID in the class, obviously you look out for symptoms, but the whole school doesn't shut down and the kids don't get sent back. So protecting these children, um, the, the, you also get cross protection to children that for some medical reason cannot actually get the vaccine. So their, their, their colleagues, their friends getting the vaccine will help protect them as well. Next slide. Miss C and myocarditis. This is something that keeps coming up and the Miss, um, the Miss C stands for multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. And this is something I wanted to just briefly touch on. So let's, let's talk about myocarditis because everybody tends to focus on, on, the, on the side effects or possible side effects of the vaccines and they focus on this. The risk of myocarditis is very, very low. It's a self-limiting condition, means, means that it actually would get better on its own and children make full recovery. Okay. Now, the number that is there, the, the 10 next to it, is just to remind me, I had done some calculations looking at the risk of getting myocarditis in children and the actual number of children in Trinidad. And if, if tomorrow we were to give all the children between the ages of 12 and 18 their vaccine we're looking to basically have 10 cases of mild myocarditis so this is this is basically the number that you're looking at so for those people that are worried about so 10 cases of mild myocarditis and they you would you'd expect them to be full recovery in a short time so what we advise for these children is to Avoid strenuous exercise as a precaution for at least one week after the vaccine, uh, especially the second dose. And this is more important for children who are very athletic and they're really straining their heart after, after their vaccine. Symptoms to look out for would be chest pain, shortness of breath or palpitations. The other, the other side of the coin, Miss C. Miss C is when children who have already had COVID-19, uh, maybe four to six weeks before, these children, some, some of them actually can be completely asymptomatic. We know that they had it because we're actually checking for antibodies in their bloods and it comes back positive. So this is something that some children get after getting COVID. And the key presentation is having fever, rashes, red eyes, red mouth, and so on. But the key one to, 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 to highlight for the parents is the fever. If your child, after having had COVID, starts to have fever again, please see your doctor. Um, they usually require hospital treatment. We are on the lookout for these children. Uh, but if it's picked up early, it is something that is treatable. But again, we are, not, we are, we, we are concerned uh, in terms of the long, long possible long-term effects on the heart, the swelling of the arteries around the heart. Um, again, the number there are 100. If all the children in Trinidad and Tobago, be, um, from basically birth, zero, to 16 were to have COVID, we're talking about hundreds of children with Messi, as opposed to reminding you about the small amount, possibly 10 cases of myocarditis you'd be looking at if all the children get their vaccine. So these are something to, 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 to bear in mind for the parents who are concerned about this, this inflammation of the heart, the myocarditis, because COVID itself, the disease can cause probably even more serious complications as opposed to this very low incidence with the vaccines. Next slide. So when it comes to vaccine acceptance, it's always about making an assessment on the risks and benefits and remembering that vaccines are meant for prevention. As I, as I, as I mentioned with the analogy of chicken pox, you really want to get your vaccines, uh, your two doses and two weeks after that to be fully, to be fully protected. So uh, it is, um, it's, it's the time if, if we do get a huge Delta outbreak and the hospitals are full and so on, that's not the time to be rushing for vaccines. Vaccines are safe. We've said that over and over and again, and they are effective even against the Delta variant. They work. Next slide. 
So the advice is for the parents to have healthy discussions with your doctor, your healthcare provider. Don't forget the child, especially those between 12 and 18. In fact, um, looking at some of the, the statements seen on TV by these teenagers, I'm quite impressed by some of the statements that they make, some of them caring and protecting their grandparents and so on. And it's actually, sometimes I wonder if some of the, these children are smarter than their parents. So please involve your child in the decision making. Speak to your pediatrician and do not, do not rely on Google Doctor for your information. So don't wait, next slide. Don't wait to get vaccinated. Don't delay to vaccinate. Um, so get your child vaccinated, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nunez. We now go to the You Speak segment. This is a segment that reaches out to you to hear your concerns and have members of our panel answer your questions. This week, the team went visited, to, visited Shaguana, sorry, so let's hear what you, the public, had to say. The Ministry of Health knows that you have your concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. So we decided to come to you. Last week, we were in Arima. This week, we're in Chaguanas. And we're here to find out your questions and your concerns. Why does one virus have so many vaccines? Okay, so that first question, why does one virus have multiple vaccines? It's nothing new for a particular virus to have multiple vaccines made against it. For example, the influenza vaccine that we all commonly take and call the flu vaccine has um, for the 2021 season, for example, 10 different types of vaccines, manufacturers, about six different manufacturers of that particular vaccine. With the pandemic, of course, there's a supply, there's a need for a large quantity of vaccines across the world. Different countries have been manufacturing the vaccine at the same time. And of course, that has led to multiple vaccines to the same virus being developed in parallel across the world in many different places at the same time. So it's really a supply and demand issue. And it is nothing new. It, it, it happens all the time with other viruses. I think just the our knowledge of this particular virus based on the pandemic is more so we are more aware of multiple vaccines being developed for this one virus yes. yeah. what are the expiration dates on the vaccine that you all have administered in Trinidad? Okay, so the expiration dates range and differs based on the type of vaccine you get and of course based on the, on the batch of that particular um, vaccine. So, for example, the Pfizer vaccine which we now have has an expiry of the 30th of November 2021. The Sinopharm vaccine which we have in country has an expiry of June 2023. Johnson & Johnson stored at minus 20 also has an expiry of 2023. The AstraZeneca which came in different batches if you remember from COVAX some of them expire at the end of October, some of them expire at the end of November. So it varies depending on the type, depending on the batch, depending on the storage. Okay, so we could go to the third question, please. Why people who took the vaccine are making it mandatory for people who choose not to take the vaccine? Okay, so in Trinidad and Tobago at this point in time, the vaccines are still voluntary. Um, in some other countries of the world, they are exploring the possibility of mandatory vaccination. The main goal of having anything being, um, in terms of mandatory, having vaccination being made mandatory, is to get maximal coverage and go towards herd immunity. So as of now, just to reiterate, Trinidad and Tobago, it's not mandatory, it's a voluntary process. Is there any vaccine for toddlers under 12? Because if the ones over 12 have to get the vaccine, that will put the trainers at a disadvantage if they have to go to school and they have to get the vaccine. So, so yes, um, there are vaccines that are under trial for under 12. For example, the Sinopharm vaccine, which we have in Trinidad and Tobago, Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine are being trialed at this point in time in different jurisdictions for use between the ages of three and 17 years of age. 
the Sinopharm vaccine, for example, has also been given emergency use authorization in China, as well as, as the United Arab Emirates most recently. And hopefully, and it's in the process of going before WHO for approval for that age group. And once, of course, WHO approves that, then we'll have that available for that particular age group and that vulnerable group, 3 to 70. You had the questions, and we provided the answers. Look out for us coming to a location near you. In the meantime, don't forget the three W's. Watch your distance, wear your mask, and wash your hands. Well, that was all the time we had for this episode of You Speak. And we certainly thank the public for sharing the information with us. And we, are, we encourage persons to look out for You Speak at the very next segment. And now we go to the question and, question and answer segment of this program. Our media representatives, you know the drill. Please state your name and the name of the media house that you represent before asking the two brief questions. Please ask your questions one right after the other to the relevant members of the panel. And of course, if time permits, we will accommodate a second round of questions where one question per media house will be accommodated. Today, we begin the question and answer with Guardian Media Limited. Good morning. Hi, morning everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. So uh, my first question would be to Dr. Nunez. Now, could you explain for us the rarity of an anaphylactic reaction to a COVID-19 vaccine, especially in children? And what would your advice be to parents who, even though this is a rare occurrence, still may not want to risk that it happens to their child? Is there anything that they could look out for from the get-go to know that, okay, my child might have that reaction? And my second question is to the Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Paris Ram, um, based on our calculations and seeing the amount of COVID-19 vaccines that we are yet to receive versus those, how much we, those we have received already and our current um, policy with administering vaccines, it appears that we're going to end up in a situation of having more vaccines than we may need to vaccinate our population. How are we going to treat with that? Are we going to tailor uh, our orders from AMSP? Are we going to, what are we going to do? Thank you, Dr. Nunes. Yes, thank you very much for that excellent question. It's in the news about anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis seems to be, it, it's been reported at Pfizer back in December of 2019 when they first started giving the vaccinations in the UK. And when you look at what happened in those cases, these were people who had severe anaphylaxis. And by that I mean they, had, they were working with EpiPens. Uh, these are adrenaline injections that they keep to themselves. So obviously these are people who had previous bad reactions. So if, if your child falls into that group, then obviously you will have a discussion with, with your, your, uh, your vaccinator, your healthcare provider before getting the vaccines. But this is something that is very, very rare. Um, some people would advise as well, if your child has a history of allergies, there are some people who are very allergic to almost everything, including Panadol. And if, they, if you have that history, you would be just like if you, before you go on, uh, and take some medications, getting the advice, and also you, there's no harm in giving some antihistamine, some allergy medication. But as you know, the ministry in, in, in the vaccination centers, that is the whole reason for being monitored closely uh, so that you don't have any reactions. And they are well prepared in there. They have their protocols, they have the medications, the doctors know what to do, what to give in case of these reactions. And most of them, they are mild reactions in terms of rashes, and so on. Um, so they are, they are prepared for it, but you should have a open discussion as a parent with your vaccinator so that it, to, so that they are aware that your child has a history of allergies. And there's no harm in giving a little bit of antihistamines before your vaccination. Thank you. Thank you. Simo, second question. Okay. Yeah. So thanks, Rashad. So generally speaking, um, we have arrangements with the African Medical um, Supplies Platform, which as you saw, we got the first tranche of Johnson & Johnson last week. Um, a lot of the arrangements, even for the Pfizer, it was a first tranche of vaccines as well. 
we have to look at what is happening globally with Pfizer being gone before WHO with regards to putting in advice that they should be given a third shot, right? Um, there's the potential that, and we have speak, spoken about this since the beginning, I think, the, the possibility of having boosters in a year's time, in six months' time. So as the months progress, we would look at, of course, the, the uptake of the vaccines in the country, and a policy decision will be taken at that point by the Honourable Minister um, and, of, and maybe the Cabinet as to what will happen in the event that we are successful, which, which is a good place to be if we get there, that the majority of the population has taken the vaccines that we have, I think is something that we can look forward to and really something that we want to see happen. And we'll be in a position then to make that decision based on the new evidence before us. Thank you very much, CMO. Uh, we now go to 98.1 FM for your two questions. Good morning to you, uh, Mr. Alexander, and uh, to the entire panel. Uh, Stephen Cummings, uh, 98.1 FM. Uh, my two questions uh, quickly, one for uh, Dr. Othello and the other for uh, the Chief Medical Officer. I would begin with uh, Dr. Othello. Dr. Othello, you uh, spoke about coping uh, mechanisms for children, um, re, I suppose, you know, in preparation for the opening of school when they, when they have to be vaccinated. But I'm wondering if there is a more comprehensive plan to treat with mental health of children um, going beyond just vaccination. Um, these children have been home for, um, what, uh, almost a year, five, six months. Um, is there a, a comprehensive uh, response, mental health response program, specifically for children um, in preparation for not during uh, their stay, um, we have just um, maybe a few weeks again before um, the opening of school. So I would like, you know, if you can uh, probably share with us um, from that perspective. And um, secondly, Dr. Prasram, I got a call uh, from one person who continues to experience um, long after effects, um, having received um, their first um, dose or shot of the Sinopharm vaccine. The person complains of what appears to be an extended period of discomfort. Um, well now, while the education continues, um, it will be interesting to hear more of uh, possible side effects of the vaccines. And are, on, uh, are there dedicated phone lines um, through which uh, such persons can channel their concerns um, of long after effects? Dr. Pastra, thank you so much. Yeah, so, so in terms of um, long after effects, if you have the specifics of that particular individual, if you could please ask her to contact our healthcare provider or us at the ministry, there is a hotline dedicated to COVID-877 well, which I think will be best placed for that person to call in in the event that they want to call in. But of course, any of our healthcare facilities can be visited or can be called um, to get further advice. Generally speaking, um, that sort of effect hasn't been noted from our side as yet, from the Ministry of Health. But certainly if you have a case and you want that person to be referred to us, we'll be happy to look into it and have them see a physician. Dr. Otello. Uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Cummings. It's a very good question. Uh, the Student Support Division of the Ministry of Education is the agency that's actually responsible for that activity. So they are actively engaged, I believe in preparing children for return to school. And not only do they, do they prepare children, but during the school year, if children have any uh, psychosocial needs or any, if the teachers or anybody else has concerns about the mental health and well-being of children, they are the first port of call. They do the first um, interaction with the child. And then if necessary, they refer the children who need additional services to the child guidance clinics that are run by the Northwest RHA, the Southwest RHA, and the Tobago RHA at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Othello and CMO. We now move to TV6. We are ready for your two questions. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Alicia Boucher from TV6. So my first question, or first two questions, um, after Dr. Parasram. Dr. Parasram, um, vaccines have been proven to reduce hospitalizations and death, but I want to ask one question of herd immunity. 
um, we, we've been told that if we could get above 70% of our population vaccinated, we could achieve herd immunity. But I'm looking against the backdrop of what's happening in Israel, where 78% of their population are vaccinated and they're actually going through a massive COVID-19 wave compared, um, described as being close to one of their worst waves prior. Um, so I want to ask, are we creating false hopes among populations and communities in terms of this idea of herd immunity with the vaccines that we do have for COVID-19? That's my first question. Second question is, because of that, because vaccinated people can also spread the virus, um, especially the Delta variant that is so transmissible, should we be reviewing our protocols for allowing re-entry into the country as it relates to um, vaccinated nationals not having to quarantine. So should we actually have them quarantine from a medical perspective in terms of the possibility of spreading um, the virus among communities? Thank you so much. Okay, so the, the concept of herd immunity, um, I think PAHO had sent out a release recently, uh, the deputy um, DG of, of PAHO saying that they have now recalculated and given 80%. Now, that is from the PAHO region. Every country is different. It depends on the way the population is spread throughout a country. If you have noticed in terms of our spread, we see spread largely around the east-west corridor and going all the way down to the, the centers, the urban centers, with less spread so in other areas. So it's, it's, it's a very um, complex epidemiological sort of modeling that you have to do to determine exactly what your herd immunity level is in any particular country or even in, in a in a county, for example. So our herd immunity will differ from County St. George Central to New River Mayaro, what is required in those particular areas. It depends on how far how far away the houses are, for example. A lot of different factors. Um, generally speaking, we the world has looked towards 70% to see what will happen based on historic patterns for other diseases. We have seen for um, people quoting for some other types of diseases, for example, the childhood diseases that you have to get above 90%. So the WHO would recommend, for example, for for MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella, that you have to get 90 to 95% of your population vaccinated in that childhood group to get to herd immunity. So it varies. It's a brand new virus. It's just, it's just um, coming to the world as of the end of 2019. And as it progresses and we see the, the evidence coming out of different countries, you will have adjustments in the in what percent you need. But I, we are aiming for the, the largest proportion of the public to be vaccinated to provide safety. And at an indi individual level, everyone should, should try to get the vaccine as soon as they can because it gives you that individual level protection. Let us not look towards the herd if you can have a vaccine on your own to be protected. Let us try to protect ourselves and our loved ones at a personal level. So in terms of your second question related to Delta, I think we had a long discourse, a couple of press conferences ago about the same question. The quarantine protocols are staying in place for now with Delta variant. Again, you can have infection. New studies are coming out every day that suggest that persons who are vaccinated have a smaller likelihood of even transmitting. It depends on the type of vaccine that you have. I've quoted before, for example, AstraZeneca gives you 67% reduction in your ability to be infected as well as to transmit. Now, with new variants coming on, of course, all of that will change because the variants behave differently in terms of their general characteristics and, of course, the way they, they, they um, commingle with vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. So we'll be continuously looking at all the guidelines and the protocols and, of course, assessing them as time goes by. But for now, we hold with the protocols. Thank you very much, CMO. IETV, good morning. We are ready for your two questions. Hi, good morning. Vida Mejes, IETV News. I have two uh, short questions. I don't know if CMO will be able to give us an update on it. Um, CMO, given that the daily numbers of cases don't seem to be reducing, I mean, sometimes it varies between 100 plus up until 200 plus. Um, is the contact tracing exercise still ongoing? I know in the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic in this country, um, we would have heard about the contact tracing and community cases and so on. Can you give us an update um, whether or not that is still ongoing too? Uh, speaking of Delta cases, the last figure we would have had 
with um, three bits and to the test the positive for the Delta variant. Can we have an update on that as well, too? Thank you. Yeah, so the, the contact tracing is a critical part of our, our work to control the spread of an infectious disease of this nature. And it is continuing um, in terms of um, test, treat, isolate, which is the, the, the WHO strategy. So we are continuing that, and it has been going on throughout the length and breadth of the, um, of the pandemic in, epidemic in Trinidad and Tobago. In terms of your Delta cases, we, still are, we are still at three. Um, I haven't ref we refer gotten any other indication from UE of any additional cases beyond the first three that we had. Thank you very much, CMO. Uh, we now move to AZP News. AZP, we are ready for your questions. Good morning. Good morning. Harry, news .com. Um, CMO, I, I want to take you to, to the, uh, the COVID-19 update of yesterday, num number 826. Um, at the bottom of it, there was the, the total number of people who, um, who have been vaccinated with, with the Pfizer, right? In it, you have um, the total number of adults vaccinated, um, first dose, um, 2,852, uh, and then you have second dose, 3,290. Is it that there are um, uh, all these these adults are they pregnant women or, or are there other people who who have been adults who are, yeah. are receiving the Pfizer vaccine and my sure. second question is for dr otello dr otello um just to piggyback on on steven's question a bit there are a lot of children who have been out of school well, well of course for more than a year now in terms of um of their socializing that has been an issue you know to to physically deal deal with other children on their age and thing. What advice you have for parents who may want to, you know, um, have concern about that, that aspect of it? Yeah, so, so thanks very much, Brian. So um, when you look at that, that press release or the, the dashboard from yesterday, the figures relate to the a daily tally. So we started to put a couple, maybe about a week ago, a little less than that, the daily updates on the bottom. So you'd see total adults vaccinated with first dose, 2,852. Total adults vaccinated with a second dose, 3,290. It gives the tally for the day. All right? So the tally for the day of the update. Similarly, you see 12 to 18, 1,707. So um, again, it, it is a daily tally. We are actually in the process of updating this to take into consideration the single dose vaccine that is coming into it. So as of today, as you know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is being rolled out through the um, outreach programs from the various RHAs. And you may see some updates in terms of the way and the structure this is coming out to you all, where it will have a place so that you can see clearly the single dose vaccines are in that update. That should be changing hopefully today. Thanks very much, Brian. Thank you for your question, Mr. Bihari. And yes, we are concerned about children. Uh, Dr. Nunes did also reference the fact that children need school for social purposes. That's where they do spend do most of their socializing. So it is a legitimate source of concern. Uh, for now, unfortunately, we have to continue with virtual methods of children socializing with their peers. You know, parents can arrange um, Zoom sessions where children can talk to one another and have some fun together. Because unfortunately, we're still not able to congregate because the threat remains a real threat. But in that regard, again, as long as your child is of the age for which vaccination is approved. That is the very reason why we're encouraging you to have your child vaccinated so that the risk is significantly reduced and so that in a shorter time frame, children will be able to go back out to school. Um, also, please be mindful of the fact that if there's a specific child who really doesn't seem to be coping well and may need specific intervention, um, if it's, it happens during the school term, you can speak to the school, um, the, the school social worker or one of or the child's teacher or someone like that so that they can be referred or you can speak to your general practitioner or any healthcare worker who can direct you to the sources of appropriate help for that child. Thank you very much, Dr. Otello. We go back to the CMO for so some no, follow-up just, information. Just to share some data, I think Prior touched on the on the Pfizer for 12 to 18. As of last night, we are at 18,623 children vaccinated. And just remember, we just began the program on Wednesday last week, um, which gives you an average of about 2,660 children per day. 
which is a very good um, average. And we are really thanking the parents and the children for coming out and continuing to do so. And we hope to get to our target in the shortest possible space of time. Thanks very much. CMO, 103.1 FM, we are ready for your two questions. Good morning. Hi, morning, everyone. Um, my two questions, my first one, um, I will pose it to the CMO. Uh, the IL-6 receptor blockers, mm -hmm. they were approved uh, roughly, I think, a month and some change ago uh, for seriously ill COVID-19 patients. And I'm not sure that we've had any updates on its usage and the impact. So I'm just asking today if I can get an update on uh, how many of, of these have been used, how many patients it has been used on, and what effect uh, have we seen because we're still seeing multiple deaths daily and my second question i'd like to pose to dr nunez and this has to do with a social media post that i saw recently actually today and it's saying that children cannot succumb to covid 19 unless woefully ill due to underlying conditions that same post also said that the us fda agrees that children should not be vaccinated against COVID-19. But could you explain, I know you touched on it a bit in your presentation, but could you explain uh, the reason that children should be vaccinated against COVID-19? Those are my two questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Nunez, we, we start with you and then we'll come back to the CMO. Sure. Um, thanks very much for that question. I would basically classify that social media post as fake news because the US FDA is recommending that children 12 to 18 be vaccinated. So if you if you have that as a reference and it's saying that it's the children not supposed to be vaccinated, um, that's not true. Again, going back to the reasons, the, the benefits for, for children getting vaccinated, the main one is for the child not to get sick, not to get COVID, and also the possibility of getting these complications, including Miss C. The other benefit would be in terms of not transmitting it to other people, to the teachers, to the grandparents, to the older adults. And the third main one would be the school we touched on, uh, which is very, very important for socializing, for the he he healthy, health, health, the mental health well-being, sorry. Um, so that, that those, those would be the main points to why children should be vaccinated. Thanks. Thank you very much. We go to Simo for the second question. Yeah. So. In terms of the usage so far, I had a discussion with Dr. Trotman a couple of weeks ago, actually, and she had put the number as just under 20, if I recall. Um, we can get the exact figure as of today back to you after. She has said they have seen improvement, um, bearing in mind that those persons that require this particular treatment are severely ill persons with COVID-19. So, um, But she has seen some improvement in outcomes based on the usage of IL-6. Thank you very much, CMO. We now move to the news day uh, for your two questions. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Rihanna McKenzie from Newsday here. Uh, my two questions. The first is for Dr. Apollo. Um, in the event that a minor wants to get the vaccine based on their own research, but are being prevented by parents or guardians who are hesitant or skeptical about it, um, what advice do you have for a minor in that situation? How do you treat with that? Uh, my second question is for the CMO. I'm not sure if you can answer this for me, um, but there were reports of a pharmacy in South selling at home COVID-19 test kits. Uh, I believe you said that it would be investigated. Um, just want to know what the progress is on that investigation. Thank you. Okay. Up. Thank you for your question, Ms. McKenzie. Uh, up to this point in time, uh, vaccination of children requires parental consent so that, yes, it would be disturbing for a child who wants to be vaccinated if their parent was not in agreement. And we would suggest to that child that they have the conversation with their parent. Don't be, you know, disrespectful or obstinate or anything like that, but just have a conversation with your parent explaining why you think you need to be vaccinated and um we hope that that parent would come around ex and explain your fa you know your fears and anxieties with respect to the risk of getting the disease and the fact that based on what you have learned from what is available in the media and other good sources the risk of being harmed by the vaccine is significantly less and almost almost you know it's really small 
compared to the real risk of being harmed by the disease. And I think, um, you know, most parents hearing that from a child would listen to that child. Sometimes, you know, people make different re re decisions for different reasons, but they don't have the conversation with the child. They may think they're acting in the child's best interest, but sometimes when they hear it from the child themselves, it makes a difference. Okay, yeah. So the second question, um, unfortunately, I can't share that information on air, as you may be well aware. Uh, it's a sensitive issue and requires investigation. So um, I can't share it at this point in time. Thank you very much, CMO and Dr. Otello. Power 102, we go to you now. Power 102, good morning. Good morning, Sparkle McIntosh, Power 102 Digital. Both of my questions are for CMO Harris Ram. Can you give an update on the vaccination rollout for pregnant women? Uh, what has the reception been like thus far? Any hiccups? My second question, uh, has there been a decrease in the number of COVID-19 tests being conducted in the past month than compared to the previous? Thank you. Hi, so, so just, um, the, the rollout would have just started a few hours ago. I didn't get any update from Dr. Sidhu Singh as yet, but right after the conference, I'll be in contact with him to see um, how that has been going throughout the different RHEs. The second question, if you could please repeat it for me, please. You want to repeat the second question? Nope. Okay. Yes, yes, I will repeat. Sorry about that. Um, has there been a decrease in the number of COVID-19 tests being conducted in the past month when compared to the previous? I, I would say just yes, there would have been a, a somewhat of a decrease. Generally speaking, what we see is that we test everyone that presents to hospital for a viral-like illness or any of the primary care settings. We also test persons now that present for pre-surgical, if you're going to have some sort of surgical procedure, we do a test on you or any other person that goes to the hospital for other reasons. Most of the institutions throughout the country are now testing those individuals as well. So there has been a small decrease and what we have noted throughout the year and a half in the epidemic when less people with viral illnesses are present in the different settings, of course the press the testing will be less. So less people presenting, less testing occurring, and that is what we're seeing now. It's a good sign and has been a good indicator of the number of people presenting to our institutions with viral illnesses. Our rolling average is now 158.7 as of yesterday, which is um, decreased from last week, which would have been up to a maximum last week of about 240. So we are seeing a slightly decreasing trend, and which is a good sign, generally speaking. Thank you very much, CMO. Well, Dr. Sajjit Singh just uh, texted me while you were speaking, and he has mentioned that there have been no hiccups thus, thus far in the rollout. So I hope that answers your question. And we do have a, a, a question coming in from Channel 5. Um, I'll just put it out. Um, what option does a child have if they want to be vaccinated, but their parents I believe Dr. Otello just answered that question just before. All right. Okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's media conference. A special thanks to our panelists, media representatives, and you, our viewing and listening public, for spending the last hour with us. We ask that you please continue to protect yourself and your loved ones. If you haven't received the COVID-19 vaccine as yet, please get yours now. Remember, the COVID-19 vaccines are safe, they are effective, they are free and available. No appointments, walk in, get your vaccine. And of course, uh, today is a very important day for those um, pregnant women um, who have reached 13 weeks or in their starting their second trimester. Of course, you know you need to get that letter from your public, uh, from your health specialist before you go uh, to get the vaccine. But please have that discussion and let's move forward. And, and finally, let's all do our part, Trinidad and Tobago. Let's vaccinate TNT. Goodbye for now.